Hello everyone, welcome back and in today's video we are going to be discussing uh, the concept electrostatic pressure so we'll be taking up some problems uh, after we discuss the required theory for electrostatic pressure and so three of these problems are from Pathfinder and, and one of the problem is from the book Purcell and Morin. Okay, so with that let's just get into the discussion part of it. So the first question is what are we even trying to find? by discussing this topic. So the answer to that is first let's consider uniformly charged spherical shell and let's say it has some surface charge density of sigma and if you observe a small patch of area on the surface of this shell let's take the area to be dA. If you observe this patch of area assume that we separate this from the sphere you can probably feel that this patch of area would feel a force in the radial direction that is basically the direction connecting the center to the patch so the patch will feel a force in that direction and it will fly out we can say that this patch uh, is actually feeling some force f and we are trying to determine that force so basically the whole problem is that we're trying to find the force acting per unit area on the surface of this shell okay guys, so i'm basically taking up uh, this patch of area da enlarging it and drawing its side view so if you look at the patch from this side you'll see the area as da okay so now you would have two questions why did i assume some thickness for uh, this element and also why did i assume it to be flat answer to that is as this is a very small element so this is this is analogous to you know you taking a da element on the surface of the earth the element is so small in comparison to the earth that we can almost neglect its curvature and assume it to be flat so guys now we know two things the electric field just outside this conductor of sigma charge density is sigma by epsilon naught and the electric field just behind the conductor is actually zero right okay now the question as to why did i take some thickness it's because guys real charge layers do not have zero thickness it it always has some negligible thickness but it definitely does have some thickness okay so that's the reason why i assumed some arbitrary thickness t so now the question is uh, how do we determine the force on this so i'll first tell you what the force uh, comes out to be so let's say the force acting is f that is going to be the electric field on this layer of charge multiplied by its charge which we know it is sigma da now what do we take the es do we take it as zero or do we take it as sigma by epsilon naught and the answer to that is it comes out to be sigma by two epsilon naught which is essentially the average of the inner electric field and the outer electric field this thing multiplied by sigma da so from here we get the force acting per unit area as sigma square by two epsilon naught so this is what i'm going to be proving in a bit okay guys so in order to prove the original result i'm going to assume this model so i'm assuming that there is some volume charge density rho that is spread across a small thickness of delta r and I'm assuming the electric field on the left to be E1 and I'm assuming the electric field on the right to be E2. So now what I'm going to do is at a small distance of x I'm going to assume a small element of elemental width dx. Okay guys so now if I zoom in the small element of width dx uh, let's say the electric field to the left is ex and the electric field to the right is ex plus de so now if i apply gauss law i can say the electric field net outflux minus the net influx of electric field is a q enclosed upon epsilon naught and q enclosed i can say it is rho dx which is the length multiplied by the a dash of the cylinder so as you can see de simply comes out to be rho dx upon epsilon naught so if i substitute it back i'll get rho a times e multiplied by dx and dx i can write it as epsilon naught de divided by rho writing it on the left side now so f by a the force per unit area on the layer of charge just becomes rho so now if i integrate this from x equals zero x equals delta r which is the thickness which is basically the entire thickness for our layer of charge i know the electric field at the at x equals zero is e1 and the electric field at x equals r delta r is e2 so from here the force per unit area that we're looking for that acts on this layer of charge comes out to be half epsilon naught e2 square minus e1 square so now going back to our original case if you see here guys e2 minus e1 that is the change in the outward field minus the inward field that is basically the discontinuity in the electric field through the charge layer this comes out to be sigma by epsilon naught right so if i substitute that result over here what i get is e1 plus e2 by 2 multiplied by sigma so the force on the patch comes out to be the average of the electric fields at the inside and the outside multiplied with the charge of the element okay so this is actually what we were trying to prove uh, over here there is also one more alternate way uh, in order to 
derive this and that is basically they separate out uh, our original element from the sphere they try to determine the electric field acting on this so again so if i consider this as a small element with surface charge distribution of sigma so this is like a zoomed side view of our original structure so i know that at points very close to this element the electric field is sigma by 2 epsilon naught so and this result we obtain from the electric field due to an uniformly charged infinite sheet right so this uh, at points really close to this field uh, this would essentially act like an infinite sheet right okay guys so let's say this is the hole from which we took out the patch and we are separately drawing this now let's forget about the original element for a while and observe uh, the hole. So if I take any Gaussian surface that passes through this hole, then we can surf, say for certain that the enclosed charge here is zero, right? Because it's a cavity. The electric field inside has to be the electric field that is outside of this Gaussian surface. If I call the electric field this hole as E other. So this is the field due to the entire sphere except this patch DA that we just removed. Okay. If I assume E other to in the outside direction, then all the inside also it has to be E other. Otherwise, uh, the net flux through that Gaussian surface would not be zero. So it has to be in the same direction and also the same magnitude. And for the patch, we know that at points close by, the electric field is sigma by 2 epsilon naught. Uh, if I superimpose these two cases, then I should get the inner electric field to be zero, which basically means the rightward e other should be cancelled by the leftward sigma by 2 epsilon naught. So from here, we can get e other as sigma by 2 epsilon naught in magnitude, right? And hence, we have proved uh, our original result. So if you isolate this dA charge, then what this will essentially feel is this e other. So, and that is essentially sigma by 2 epsilon naught. And hence, we have proved that the electric field that this feels is, is sigma by 2 epsilon naught. Okay, so now let's try to solve some problems with these concepts. Okay guys, so uh, this question is essentially, you know, just the derivation that we just did in like the last two pages. So basically we have an infinite layer of charge uh, of uniform thickness T. It is placed normal to an existing uniform electric field presence of this charge layer. So basically we have a charge layer, okay? And to the left is E1, field to the right is E2. And it's given that the charge distribution in the layer is not uniform and depends only on the distance from its faces, okay? So, and guys, if you remember the, in the derivation, the force expression that we just, you know, that we derived had nothing to do with the rho. So it doesn't matter if the charge density is uniform or not. At the end, the result only depends on this E2 and E1. That's a very interesting result, okay? So find expression for the force per unit area experienced by the charge layer. So I'm just gonna write it in one line. So this is what we derived in that page. So it came out to be half epsilon naught E2 square minus E1 square. So now let's solve this question. So we have a conducting shell whose radius is R. It has a charge Q. So electrostatic force between two parts of the shell, which are on either sides of the plane, that is at a distance of small r from the center of the shell. So we have a shell, something like this. If we section it something like this, so we have this distance over here to be small r. And if I like um, slice this piece, then we have to find the force acting on this, this piece that looks like a cap. Okay guys, so what I'm doing is first drawing an axis and at an, at an angle of theta from this axis, I'm taking a patch, something like this, whose area is dA. Now, from our previous page discussion, we know that the, that the electrostatic pressure acting on this patch due to the entire conductor is sigma square by 2 epsilon. And the interesting thing is uh, this is constant for each patch on the surface. So if I want to write the dF force acting on this element, so it's going to be the electrostatic pressure, which is the force per unit area, multiply it with the area. But there's a catch here. So we can observe that as I vary this patch along this cap, then the net force will be in the upward direction. Okay, let's just take the upward direction as Z cap. So the net field will be in the Z cap direction. Essentially, all we have to do is just integrate the vertical component so this angle is theta. So, so we are only interested in the dfz because the net force will simply be the integral of that. So this is going to be sigma square by two epsilon naught times dA cos theta. Okay, so now uh, there are two ways to go by now. You can actually write dA in terms of spherical coordinates and, if, and that comes out to be r square sine theta d theta d phi. And if you have no idea what I just said, then still there is no problem because if you integrate this expression, sigma is a constant, right? So I can take it out. If it was not a constant, then you cannot apply this method, guys, because this interesting expression of integral dA cos theta wouldn't come. If they give sigma as some function of theta, then you have to go by polar integration. So for, uh, in that case, you have to take dA as r square sine theta d theta d phi. 
Okay, and uh, D5 is basically if I project this onto the XY plane, and let's say if I ob obtain the projection something like this, phi is the angle that this projection makes with the x-axis. So, and this will be these two will be separate integrals. So, I'm not covering it in this video. We can use symmetry to our advantage in this problem. So, uh, if I observe this patch closely, uh, the electric field is along the normal to the patch, right? It makes an angle of theta with the vertical. So, D A cos theta is essentially the horizontal component of this area. If you put a torch above here and light a source, then the shadow of this will be this horizontal element that is dA cos theta. If you put a light source over here and if you try to find out the shadow of this cap, it would be the area of the base on which this cap is resting. Okay guys, so the radius of the base of this cap, we can easily determine using trigonometry, right? So this distance is smaller. Uh, so this distance is given to us as smaller and this distance is capital R which basically means the radius of this cap is square root of capital R squared minus small r squared, right? So integral dA cos theta, we can simplify it as pi times the radius squared. So this will be capital R squared minus small r squared. So this will be our required answer. And after writing sigma as q divided by four pi r squared, you'll obtain this expression for the net force acting on the spherical cap. This corresponds to option D. So moving on to the next problem. So we, so we have a charged soap bubble that experiences an outward electrical force on every bit of its surface. So you can consider, you can model the bubble as exactly the uniformly charged conducting shell that we just discussed. So given a total charge Q on the bubble of radius R, what is the magnitude of the resultant force tending to pull any hemispherical half of the bubble away from the other half? Okay, so, so we have a positively charged soap bubble here. And they're asking the force that is trying to pull this hemisphere away. So that will be the electrical forces, right? So in the last page, as we determined, so this will be sigma square by two epsilon naught times a projected area of the shell in the vertical plane, right? So that is going to be a circle, right? In this case, it will be pi r squared. And this question has appeared in a J advanced PYQ, I believe. And the force that is stopping hemispherical bubble from being split into two halves is force due to surface tension. And the surface tension force acts at the periphery or the circumference of this hemisphere. And as we have two surfaces, guys, as this is a soap bubble, we have to consider two liquid air interfaces. Uh, so the force, you have to double it for what we obtained in the case of a liquid drop. So the forces are going to act something like this. And the net force due to surface tension is going to be T times the total length along with it is acting which is actually 2 pi r right so t times 2 pi r and we have to double it just because of the fact that this is a bubble and this has to be balanced by the electrostatic force and uh, in the question they ask what is the magnitude of the resultant force tending to pull any hemispherical half of the bubble away from the other half so that will be the electrostatic that will be the difference of these two so this is the force that they are uh, so check 27 this particular problem this i thought initially this was based on uh, electrostatic electrostatic pressure but this is more of an energy minimization problem so yeah, I'm skipping this for this video. If you want the solution to this, you can just comment down below. I'll make a video on it. But for the matter of this video, I'm skipping this. Okay guys, so uh, we are going to be doing this problem. In so basically in this question, we have a, a charge sphere with uniform volume charge density of rho. And we have to find the force that the bottom hemisphere uh, applies on the top hemisphere. Okay, so again, uh, like we did previously, we are going to uh, at a distance of small r. So the radius of the sphere is capital R by the way. So at a distance of smaller, I am taking a volume charge element uh, whose volume let's say is dV. Now forget about the rest of the sphere. So we know that the electric field at this particular point on this dV element due to the rest of the sphere is rho R upon three epsilon naught and it is radially outward. So again, I'm assuming this polar angle to be theta. This angle will also be theta. Using the same method we did for the hemispherical shell, we know that the net force on the upper hemisphere is simply the integral of, let's say this is a z cap direction, so the integral uh, of the dfz components. So this would come out to be integral of the electric field, which is rho r by 3 epsilon naught, times the charge of the element, which is going to be rho multiplied by dv, times cosine of theta. So now I can take all the constants outside, so that is rho square by 3 epsilon naught, and on the inside of the integral, uh, we get integral of r cos theta multiplied by dv. So guys, whenever you see some position vector multiplied by a quantity and the integral of this, first thing that should come to your mind is the center of. So the thing is, r cos theta is going to be the y coordinate of our volume charge. So basically we are picking up all such dv charges, multiplying its volume with the with its y coordinate. So this is essentially what the definition of the y coordinate of the centroid is or you could say it's the center of volume. And the way you calculate that is you integrate the y coordinate 
multiply it with dv and divide it with the total volume. We can write this as, as the centroid of the volume, which we know for, for a solid hemisphere, it is going to be at a distance of 3r by 8 from the center of curvature. So this is going to be 3r by 8 multiplied by the total volume of the hemisphere. So that is going to be 2 by 3 pi r cubed. And after solving, you'll get the per force on the upper half of the hemisphere as this particular value. Okay, so that was it for this video, guys. If you enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe. And that's it. Thanks for watching.